now we are going to have the oration ceremony and mr arul emmanuel is going to have be the orator and i request dr mr pala rajesh the vice president from royal college of edinburgh to read the citation about the orator before i'll try to connect to hc dr he is really excited he and his family would be also keen to watch uh, from home i'm sure they are already watching and over to mr pala from scotland thank you very much it is a great honor to be in um in the uk at the present time to deliver the oration of the hd doctor award to my colleague mr arul emmanuel mr president distinguished guests on the dais ladies and gentlemen it's a great honor to present mr arul emmanuel from newcastle as the first hd doctor orator of the indian association of gastro intestinal endosurgeons during this first indo uk surgicon 2020 this is an iages and the royal college of surgeons of edinburgh this is an iages and the royal college of surgeons of edinburgh's first collaborative conference arul currently works as a consultant in general and upper gastrointestinal surgery at the northern esophageal gastric unit in newcastle upon tyne at the royal victoria infirmary he graduated from madurai medical college and pursued his postgraduate um, degree in ms in surgery from my alma mater at the madras medical college before proceeding to the united kingdom for his further training in surgery he did his surgical rotations obtained his fellowship in general surgery in 2007 from the college of surgeons of edinburgh and he pursued a period of research at newcastle under the tutelage of professor mike griffin he was conferred the doctorate of medicine for his work in identifying the prevalence and susceptibility of metachronous and synchronous cancers of the esophagus and head and neck in december 2006 He then pursued a period of fellowship at the Flinders University Hospital in Adelaide in Australia and returned back to set up an advanced laparoscopic and robotic surgical management center in Newcastle along with Mike Griffin. His interest was in benign esophageal and gastric conditions and minimally invasive robotic surgical approach to cancer of the esophagus and stomach he has extensive surgical experience in that he has performed more than 300 esophageal gastric resections and he continues to perform from the largest number of resections from the largest center in the north of england he has established an internationally acclaimed enhanced eras program for patients undergoing resections in the unit he has presented and published extensively including his research work in the field of esophageal gastric surgery in numerous scientific forums and many internationally reviewed peer reviewed journals he has to his credit several publications and abstracts he is deeply passionate about patient care he takes great pride in being a team player and an excellent communicator with patients and their relatives he is an enthusiastic teacher and always enjoys teaching and supervising the development of junior medical staff and his colleagues in the unit he is a fellow of the edinburgh college and a member of the upper gastrointestinal surgeons of great britain and ireland and a member of the international society of diseases of esophagus president ladies and gentlemen it is a great honor and privilege to present before you mr arul emmanuel for delivering dr h g doctor oration on esophageal gastric surgery past present and future during this indo uk surgicon conference on this day 16th october 2020 thank you
Thank you, thank you, Mr. Pala Rajesh, Arul Emanuel. Before you go in for your oration, just I take you briefly to Dr. H.G. Doctor. It's an emotional moment for them. Let me see whether I can connect with them uh, just for a few minutes. Dear ages, I thank you very much for having the 2020 oration in my name. It is indeed an honor and a privilege for me that the association has bestowed this oration on me. I am very pleased to know that the association that we doctors co-founded is growing from strength to strength. Thank you and all the best for AIGS 2020. Give a big hand. I think it is a very emotional moment. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the affection the family showed, the granddaughter showed. I think it was really nice. I think, uh, Arul Emmanuel, you are gifted to give this speech. I think this first of its kind under the name of Dr. H.T. Doctor. And over to you, Arul. You, you can scare, share the screen now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Rajesh, for the very kind words. Um, and good evening to all of you. Uh, and I bring greetings from uh, Newcastle upon Tyne in. in uh, uh, United Kingdom. I would like to thank um, all the uh, organizers of the IAGS for giving me this wonderful opportunity. And uh, it does, does make me emotional that, you know, um, and that I'm um, presenting um, the first uh, Dr. Ration. I read a lot about him last night. And it is indeed my privilege uh, and pleasure to give the Ration in your name. And uh, clearly, you've been one of the pioneers and a visionary of not only Indian, but uh, Asian and global surgery. Thank you very much. Um, um, as um, Rajesh had um, introduced me, my, I am Arul Emanuel. I'm a consultant esophageal gastric surgeon, and uh, my practice is at the Northern Esophageal Gastric Cancer Unit uh, in Newcastle upon Tyne, United Kingdom, which is the largest unit of its kind in not only in the UK but in Europe. And the reason I say that is we see about nearly 700, 800 cases every year. I do have a disclaimer before I go into my talk: is that my talk is purely on the art of esophageal surgery, as it would be impossible to cover all aspects of esophageal cancer, or indeed I wouldn't be ju doing justice to it in the time um, I've been given. So in the UK, um, we see more than 9,000 cases of esophageal cancer diagnosed every year. Majority of them are adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, which is slightly unlike uh, mm -hmm. the rest of Scotland, uh, one of the highest incidences of this subtype of cancer in the world. The overall mortality still remains very high and is one of the highest in the country in comparison to other cancers. This remains the case worldwide, irrespective of the histological subtype. So what I'm going to do is to, in the next so 10 to 15 minutes, is to walk you through the journey, how, how esophageal surgery has evolved and the role it has played in improving lives of patients with this unfortunate disease. And to look forward with a lot of hope of progressively improving outcomes with the art of surgery. In the early 1900s, the diagnosis of esophageal cancer um, was primarily a death sentence. Not only was it a death sentence, but also a miserable and a painful one. It was really in the, 18, in the 1980s when surgery was more widely practiced as a treatment for esophageal cancer, more with hope rather than intent but the intent was of better palliation. The outcomes were st still very dismal. In the late 1980s, the mortality following esophageal surgery was around 75%. In real life, only one in three patients who had this operation actually left the hospital after the operation. Move over to the 1990s. As the survival figures started to improve and the belief that surgery does offer a chance of cure for this dreadful disease, the focus now turned to how best can the surgery be done. The debate still continues, though there is some consensus that in comparison, transthoracic esophageal resection has lower anastomotic leak rate. And in locally advanced cases, there's a higher rate of R0 resection, a higher lymph node yield with the hope of a prolonged survival of transthoracic resections. As surgery became firmly established as a cornerstone for esophageal cancer survival, the debate then included and focused on how radical surgery should be. 
Again, this depends on which side of the fence one sits in. You will find evidence and literature to support this. However, what is clear is that radical surgery does adhere to oncological principles we have all been brought up in. It does offer a better staging. It does offer better local region control and hopefully should translate into better survival. Looking into the UK um, survival statistics, the Cancer Research UK regularly put out the statistics. One year survival for esophageal cancer is between 70 to 80%. And this drops down to about 50 to 60%, and then to 40 to 30% in three years. And if you look at the five year survival, it's still very dismal around 20 to 30%. The associations of surgeon of uh, the associate of GI gastrointestinal surgeons in the UK uh, do collect data on the number of resections performed in the country, along with their morbidity, mortality, uh, and the outcomes. Now, if you look at, the, at this chart, this is where Newcastle stands, and then and this was the last data set from 2019. This indicates that the Northern Esophageal Gastric Cancer Unit performs the most number of operations in the country, and has done so so since the last. 25 years. Okay, we do perform the most number of operations. How does this translate into outcomes? If you look at the chart and if you look at the, um, the graph, uh, we have seen a progressive increase in the five-year survival since 1990s. And in 2017, when we analyzed our last five-year cohort, the overall survival, five-year survival was 47%. How is this compared? to the national statistics. If you look at the statistics on the right, it's currently around 50% when we analyzed our next five-year cohort. So to the Northern Esophageal Gastric Cancer Unit, we cure one in two patients who undergo surgery. And you when you compare this against the national outcomes, the stark difference is quite obvious. We are in the process of publishing our 25-year outcome and survival data. As you can clearly see, that there is now a consistent survival of over 50% five-year survival. And this includes every patient that, that walks through the doors of our hospital with esophageal cancer. We now know that surgery if done well, and of course, with the advent of new chemo radiotherapy regimes and better quality of care results in good survival. The focus now turns to how do we reduce the morbidity of the significantly morbid operation? It is very fitting that Sir Alfred Kosheri is um, in this uh, amongst the dignitaries because he performed the first minimally invasive esophagectomy in the world. By this time, around the 1990s, minimally invasive techniques had exploded within the various fields of surgery. There was, however, a delayed and slightly muted acceptance of this within the OG fraternity, and for the right reasons. The initial embracement of this technique did result in increase in morbidity rather than decrease because corners were cut, resulting in some serious complications. However, the general concepts of minimally invasive surgery, which includes less blood loss, less complications, less pain, faster recovery, is still very applicable to minimal invasive esophagectomy as well. In 2003, Jim Lukatic from Pittsburgh in the United States first published his paper on about 222 patients. This became a pioneering concept the publication of attaining sentinel status. Since then, there's been many studies publishing results of various forms and techniques of minimal invasive esophagectomies. However, there remains ongoing debate whether a superior, which is superior, or which is the best technique. The first randomized controlled trial in looking into open versus minimal invasive surgery was the TIME trial by Miguel Cuesta Group in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. They published saying that respiratory complications were much less, hospital stay was much shorter, the quality of life was better uh, after minimally invasive surgery. No, there was no difference in oncological survival. Another important study by the late Christophe Marriott from Lille in France compared open surgery to a hybrid approach. Again, the criticism of the study was a very high rate of complications in the open group. And it did include a heterogeneous group of surgeons. However, further oncological and quality of life data are still to come, and I believe this is going to be published in the next couple of weeks. Having said that, this is the only RCT study to have shown a difference favoring laparoscopic mobilization. 
Turning attention to global outcomes, the Global Collaborative Data Platform was set by a dear friend Don Law from Seattle. The concept was actually birthed at an ESD meeting in Newcastle. Now, most of the major units in the world input their data into this platform, and I'm sure many of you do so as well. At this juncture, I would like to thank Don uh, for providing me with the slides. An initial analysis of the data set a few years ago revealed globally around 50% of the cases are performed in a minimally invasive manner. Again, this was very similar to a review which took part in Netherlands in 2017, where again, 50% of the cases were done in a minimally invasive way. The data set seems to suggest that the common approach seems to be a transthoracic one. And when performed minimally invasive, there is a mix of hybrid techniques and minimally invasive techniques. Again, there was no difference in the lymph node harvest and the procedure was performed either minimally invasive or open. There was no difference in the length of stay or even in the event of complications, there was no difference between the two techniques. Again, there was no difference in the length of stay whether the operation was performed transhiatally or through a transthoracic approach. This was the same when the, when the operation was performed in a minimally invasive manner as well. What's happening in the UK? The last set of statistics suggests around 41% of the operations of esophagectomies are performed in some form of minimally invasive manner. This I'm sure has gone up, but I'm sure it's not more than 50% at the moment. So this was a randomized control study by the Jane Blaise Pigou from Bristol in the UK, which um, I believe the, um, we're waiting for the outcomes to come. And they looked into randomizing patients into an open group versus a hybrid group versus a totally minimally invasive group. What's happening in Newcastle? We adopted a minimally invasive technique back in 2015. And over the next few years, we modified the technique I'm trying to play the video. And we published our initial outcomes, which was at least comparable to the open technique, if not better. Our cyber well data has just been accepted for publication, which suggests that the minimally invasive cohort of patients do have a survival advantage in the long run. The way we designed our program was one surgeon did the first 50 cases to get over the learning curve. And now three of us in the unit performed this operation. And clearly the learning curve was much shorter for the other two. Despite the never ending debate of whether minimally invasive surgery is better than open surgery, what is clearly evident is it is safe to say that minimally invasive esophagectomy is definitely non-inferior in terms of oncological outcomes, complications, mortality, and length of stay. What about the quality of life for these patients who undergo this morbid procedure? Again, there's a plethora of literature out there. A well-studied recent publication from the Lagergren group in Sweden from Karolinska University, which was published last month, suggests there's no difference in the quality of life between open and minimally invasive esophagectomy. This is both inclusive of short and long-term outcomes. In fact, a follow-up analysis of the time trial from Miguel Kester's group suggests that minimally invasive esophagectomies performed outside a trial setting actually resulted in increased complications and reoperation rate. So where's things gone wrong for minimally invasive esophagectomy? Why has it, why has the minimally invasive approach not become the standard approach unlike many other sp surgical specialties? And why cannot this procedure be replicated consistently? Those who do this operation for starters do understand esophageal surgery is an extremely complex operation with serious outcomes, which result as a result of complications associated with it and the profound morbidity associated with it. In this setting, minimal invasive surgery should be offering a better solution to this problem with this better vision and access, but it's still very much limited by a two-dimensional vision varied and distorted eye-hand coordination, 
loss of dexterity and variable quality of assistance. So where do we go from here as an OG community? I mean, clearly standardization in surgery has been proven to improve efficiency, uh, clinical outcomes and patient safety. However, this has been near impossible in esophagastric surgery, at least till now. Standardization in surgery is not a new concept. Robert Dickinson, an eminent obstetrician from Brooklyn, New York, published this article in 1914. He said, a man with a shovel and an apprentice bricklayer have got more standardized approach rather than a, st and a trained surgeon. And he concluded his article by saying that there is good evidence in 1914 to say that surgical advances will be regular and erratic unless standardized. Medical field indeed has seen a lot of standardization, including protocols for treating patients, classification of diseases, complications, and so on and so forth. However, surgical technique seems to vary not only amongst nations, but within individual units, and indeed in, amongst individuals as, as well. All our randomized controlled trials, studies, collaborative efforts, unfortunately have not resulted in improved surgical outcomes, despite great advances in surgical techniques. Certainly minimal invasive surgery was a great step to bridge some of the gap which exists between units and nations. However, the world statistics, as we looked before, tells us only 50% of this operation is being performed in a minimally invasive manner. Certainly, laparoscopic and thoracic surgery, and thoracoscopic surgery has been a great leap for patients, but not, not enough to make a clean difference. And in many ways, it's been a step back for surgeons. How do we tackle this? Could technological evolution be the answer to this? R robotic surgery might be an answer to this. There's been one trial which has been published from the uh, Richard Van Hilliger's group in, in Netherlands. It's called the robot trial where they compare the open versus robotic esophagectomy. And according to the trial, there was a reduction in pulmonary, cardiac, and overall complications. There's been a reduction in blood loss, improvement in objective post-op pain, better quality of life in six weeks, and also comparable oncological outcomes. Since then, there has been an ever-increasing publication of case series suggesting non-inferiority of robotic esophageal surgery. What is becoming increasingly evident is that, is that through robotic surgery, the steps of surgery can be replicated quite easily, taught better due to some incredible vision and freedom of movement. And this may be the step in the right direction towards, towards the standardization. The case you're watching now is a D2 uh, lymphadenectomy whilst performing a gastric mobilization for esophageal cancer. So we're taking the common hepatic node off the, the artery. And the dissection now proceeds on to to the gastrohepatic ligament with, with excision of the gastrohepatic ligament node going up to the porta then clearing the portal vein you'll see the portal vein in a minute then exposing the left gastric vein and artery. The left gastric vein and artery are then clipped and then cut. And then the, the dissection is carried on to the splenic vessels, taking all the lymph glands on the splenic vein and the artery. This certainly could be standardized and could be repeated, which we have found the case in our unit. And again, when you go to the thoracic part, again, this could be a very standardized approach to the mobilization of the esophagus. For lack of time, I'm not going to go through the whole video. I'll just come down to the anastomosis. And again, 
the esophageal anastomosis following uh, two stages of ejectomy is the bane of most of the esophageal surgeons. A purse string is employed. And the mini thoracotomy is done through which the specimen is taken out. A circular staple is inserted. You can use ICG to assess the right place. The anastomosis carried out. It's an end to side anastomosis. And then an ornamental wrap is performed to strengthen the anastomosis. As surgeons, we all be in a situation we have to think and act outside the box. And I'm sure surgical experience in this setting with a multidisciplinary team approach will continue to defy and aid standard practice. So this is a patient who had previous colonic surgery and had extensive esophagogastric cancer and he was reconstructed with the colon and the middle colic was supercharged with the internal mammary artery. This is how it looked prior to supercharging. And then this is after the charging. You've all listened to endoscopic surgery from the professor of um, the Royal College of Surgeons yesterday, so I'm not going to go into the details of endoscopic surgery, but this forms a major part of our routine work in Newcastle. Um, we do about 100 and 135 endoscopic resections of early esophageal and gastric cancer, and this is now almost a standard treatment for all our T1A disease uh, and also for staging purposes. Um, this has been published extensively uh, and this is now a very standardized technique in the unit. And we've shown that, you know, Patients who undergo this treatment do have excellent survival for early cancer. So to come to conclude, um, current practice of minimal invasive operation and robotic surgery will expand. Further advances in surgical systems will aid and improve techniques, preoperative simulation, and artificial intelligence will facilitate, facilitate the surgeon to do better surgery in the future. And I'm sure in time, individualized surgery will come with central node mapping and central node navigation. So president, organizer of the meeting, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to finish by saying that it is important to adhere to the time and tested principle of surgery, which included optimal staging, endeavor to reduce local region recurrence, improve overall survival and improve quality of life. Operative approaches may have an impact on outcomes. However, other intervention like enhanced recovery and better chemotherapy, chemo radiotherapy techniques might have a greater impact. However, quality of surgery must be identical with any approach we employ. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Earl Emmanuel. That was a great talk with the clarity and conviction. We have with us the president-elect, Dr. Sunil Papad, to say a few words and a formal word of thanks. Over to you, Sunil. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Arul Emmanuel. It was a very concise and very thorough lecture on the esophageal cancer and what is happening now and what is the future. I'm very impressed with the training part of the uh, thing which you narrated and you discussed. And uh, certainly with the collaboration between IAGES and Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, the Indian surgeons and UK surgeons, I think we will be delighted to send our fellows for training in future to your center and to other centers in UK for the advanced training in laparoscopic surgery and similarly vice versa. At this juncture, I would like to pray my tribute to Professor H.G. Dr. Sir, in whose memory this oration has been uh, started. This is the first oration and I'm very delighted to see Dr. H.G. Dr. at his home and uh, he's one of the founder member of IAGES 
and he has nurtured this association over the last 25 years. I'm thankful to my co-chairman, Dr. Ramesh Agarwala and uh, Mr. Rajesh Pala, Vice President of Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, for being here with me in chairing this session. And I thank President Raman Goel and Honorary Secretary Ishwamurthy for giving this opportunity to be along with this giants of laparoscopic surgery today evening. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you, Mr. Pala Rajesh. And thank you, Ramesh Akarwala, for having shared the session. Good evening, friends. It has been a wonderful journey for all of us during this pandemic year. And uh, IAGS partnered with the Access Edinburgh to give this uh, important sessions on interview research on, especially the forecast sessions. In fact, uh, forecast sessions have been a runaway success where one could see a galaxy of uh, international experts and a galaxy of speakers talking on various important subjects. The last week has been an exciting journey of uh, having a relook of what has been happening in these important sessions. And uh, Doplexes have been uh, kind enough in hosting a set again on behalf of the IAGS to take back to the golden memories of listening to the global experts. So let us have a brief relook of what has been happening in the forecast sessions. Uh, the expert sessions were uh, shared by Professor Indian Samarasam from Christian Medical College Bello and Dr. Kashik from Siliguri. To start with, the president of the IHGS for 2021 started the sessions with the most important and uh, ever seeked after laparoscopic fund application. In fact, uh, Dr. Sunil has two and a half decades of experience in handling laparoscopic fund application. He touched upon the most pertinent issues on fund application and what are the questions we are staring at when we have come through a long journey of standardization and uh, safe outcome of fund application. The most pertinent challenges are, are we reach the right technique? And Sunil very effectively concluded telling individualized approach is the right approach with due investigations and evaluation before considering an operation for fund application in the patient. Then we move on to the GERD operations, none other than uh, Professor Pandit Bilal. Um, he went on to challenge the standards of uh, GERD. Do we divide the short gastrics or do we not divide the short gastrics? First of all, whether it is needed at all and what are the pros and cons of dividing the short gastrics? And it's been an, a lot of learning for us when we could see the benefits on either side and the so-called formula-based approach, all the short gastrics have to go, is no more true. Then we had the fortune of uh, watching the fine hands of uh, Prof. Silesh Puntandekar Pumpona. He went on to demonstrate a wonderful uh, skill set being exposed on the minimal invasive details of echogastrophony. Some or other esophageal gastrectomy has been always a challenging procedure. A distal stomach, body stomach is uh, the most common general surgical procedure anyone would face. Here, Dr. Silesh has very categorically mentioned what is the extent of surgery, what is the radial clearance required, and what are the nodal dissections, what are the safety of the nodal dissections. Thank you, Dr. Silesh, sir, for uh, making us to learn the right way to do this procedure. Then our ever youthful and most energetic uh, laparoscopic surgeon, Dr. Sarkar Salibai, he went on to reminisce the challenges he has been facing in the benign esophageal surgery. And in fact, he gave a treatise of uh, various uh, surgeries, which has been uh, happening, which has been happening over the past two decades on benign esophageal surgery, how to face it, and how to come out if there is a complication. So that is about the expert talk. 
now we move on to the next batch of uh, the sessions um the free papers i would be doing injustice if i call it as a free paper session most of them were very senior faculty showing that the best of the upcoming minimal invasive surgery techniques in the forehead surgery we had the fortune of having uh, from the promotion day of om tantia sharing this uh, session none other than dr subramaneshwar rao highlighted the importance of esophageal cardiovascularity by the icg imaging and in fact it was a lot of learning because the most dreaded complications of forehead surgery is the anastomotic leak and that happens when you are not sure about the vascularity and it may what may look like okay icg highlights the vascularity may be little is insufficient so that's where you have the opportunity to do the adequate amount of trimming so that the anastomosis is secure thank you dr subramaneshwar rao for sharing your expertise on that then we move on to dr sudarshan from chennai who has um, brought in a wonderful case of gastric valvulus he touched upon the various component of the early evaluation early stabilization what is the right way to reduce the valvulus and he went on to tell how to repair the valvulus and how to tighten the hiatus and what are the steps to be taken for preventing a long term recurrence thank you dr sudarshan for highlighting that then we move on to something uh i would say an unusual complications of uh, mesh in giant hydrocephalus it was a series by dr shobit singha where he went on to show the protraction of mesh the erosion of mesh the fistulization the most top complications of mesh thank you dr shobit i'm sure all the audience would have enjoyed and learned from your thing then something translational we should appreciate the efforts taken by dr krishna kant where he went on to do the study post operative tissue study following gastrectomy how and what is the prevalence status of helicobacter and then he also highlighted the importance of helicobacter eradication in these patients then subsequently we had the very eminent panelist and the most important moderator it is indeed a global outlook of uh, what are the training and research issues by the global leaders of forehead surgery one could see the galaxy of uh, speakers professor simon law from hong kong professor simon dexter professor cs ramesh from the tata memorial mark smithers and homer ways from usa in fact it was a half an hour of power packed deliberations on various issues and then subsequently they moved on for another 20 minutes to talk about various components of research issues how forehead surgery is going to go thank you professor simon for uh, coordinating such a wonderful uh, international panel discussion then the master videos the best of the class master videos chaired by professor vijay abraham from australia and mohammed ibrahim from madurai both of them leading forehead surgeons and surgical oncologists with themselves where one could see the master craft of professor rajinder prashad's ls cardiomyopathy in fact he made arithmetic approach towards the ls cardiomyopathy 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 so that makes job very clear and lucid and makes the job of the learner and people who want to perfect the technique of myotomy should witness this video again and again for making a very categorical approach then we could see the mastery of uh, professor sanjeev hari bhakti where he went on to discuss about the sister gastrostomies and sister jejunostomies the use of forehead for drainage of the pancreas what an art it was he highlighted the importance of edge biopsies highlighted the important of secure anastomosis highlighted the challenges of doing an anastomosis with stomach and small bowel to the pancreas especially the inflammatory cysts and thick walls cysts thank you thank you dr sanjeev for highlighting the various aspects of uh, pancreatic anastomosis then we had the master classman professor jimmy so from national university of singapore where he demonstrated the gold standard of gastrectomy the minimal invasive d2 gastrectomy starting from the port placement ergonomics he went on to say 
media to lateral lateral to medial what are the pros and cons and how to safely remove all the nodes and what is the clear margins have how to achieve that and how to give a oncologically safe operation in these patients then we had the fortune of uh, listening to handling various types of forget gastrointestinal stroma tumors by none other than professor ajay upadhyay from usa what a master surgeon he is he went on to show us the difficulty of uh, fundal gist body gist as well as the tail gist so it is a must watch for all of you i would say you can revisit this video as many number of times as these are not common operations but then it has its own exclusive nuances which have to be taken into consideration when you are going to do this operation thank you dr upadhyay for helping us to learn this handling of jast thank you for identifying and telling us the cases which will benefit from endoscopic assistance i would say in a hybrid operation helps in these patients and the usage of appropriate staples from the appropriate port ergonomics makes this surgery a feather thank you professor upadhyay then we had the fortune of uh, having a masterly chairing of uh, this session the debate the debate has been always the highlight of the meeting and we had professor avinash shupe from mumbai and we had uh, professor abdul majid chaudhry from pakistan uh, chairing this session and add to the crown and the jewel on the crown we had the master batsman professor ajay kriplani and professor murthy from uk debating on this high tight issue again rocks were crumbling mountains were crumbling but still both of them stick on to their guns and it was very clear the road has to be traveled in parallel and there is no crossing of roads each other there were clear incidences clear in the indications for not to use mesh and clear indications to use mesh so this science will be challenged for decades to come but i am sure they both of them have given us a very big clarity on handling this part of operation and i'm sure at least we have learned where not to use mesh and where to use mesh so it's been a wonderful journey all through and uh, i am happy to bring out the outlook of the four get sessions and i'm sure iags this year also are going to work hard to give yet more exciting academics and we look forward to having you amidst us in the near future for the iags 2021 the international annual congress to happen in pimbatu we welcome you one and all thank you thank you for staying with us all through thank you iags and thank you doc flexus for making this possible goodbye